Modern marriage is a man-eating trap. So today we got a question from a viewer who says, Yo, Elliot, I want to marry my girlfriend. I love her and I want to make a family. The problem is I'm aware of the legal traps of having a marriage license, he says. He says, I understand that the divorce rates are high. They're mostly initiated by women. And with this marriage license, the family courts and the government is usually stacked against the men. Men lose in all divorce cases and upwards to 90% of divorces are initiated by women. So it's literally like walking into a trap. Also, he recognizes that in this context, as crazy as it sounds, men have all the responsibility, but none of the authority in this state-sanctioned marriage and marriage license situation. I thought of this analogy when you mentioned having all the responsibility and none of the authority. I remember being a kid and uh, our sidewalk in front of the house had a crack in it. And I would, I asked my dad, because my dad fixes everything. I'm like, dad, why, did, why is the sidewalk this way? Why don't you fix it? Because somebody might trip over it and you could get in trouble. Well, he explained to me that according to the state laws, I'm not allowed to touch that. It's in front of my house. But if somebody trips over it, I take all the responsibility. So you have no authority over the sidewalk in front of your house, meaning you can't change it, fix it, work with it, deal with it in a resourceful way without permission. And then if someone trips over it, you're at fault. And that's kind of like what modern marriage in this government sanctioned context really is all about. You're in a contract that says you have all the responsibility. It's been traditional that men have all the responsibility, but the minute your other half woman per se says, you know what, I don't like something. I'm out of here, you can't do anything about it. So if shit goes south, it's your fault. It's always your fault, it's always the man's fault. And so that's why you know he's hesitant, our friend is worried, and it is a tough question to answer from a man who loves marriage. I love being married, I love my wife, I love my parents who remain married and gave us the tradition of lifelong marriage. I have an example of a good marriage. My, me and my wife model ourselves after my parents and hopefully my children will carry on the tradition of a lifelong traditional marriage. Also, it is a life spring. It is a joy. It is an amazing thing and I wish it could work, but I'm not gonna lie, the way things are set up today, modern marriage, like I said, is a fucking trap. But there are some things that you could do, and it begins with context. But before we get into my opinion about what you can do, which begins with how you think about marriage and then ends with some things you can actually do, I want to talk a little bit about how we got into this trap that we are in in terms of marriage. And by the way, it's not that marriage doesn't work or can't work. It's that marriage is under attack. Marriage is under attack from the government meaning rules and laws and obligations and contracts and shit like that, but it's also under cultural attack. Uh, our society, Western society, whether you know it or not, has been in covert war for the last 100 years. And so this war uh, is manifest on multiple fronts, government, school, music, media, all these things, laws, right, it designed to do a number of things to subvert our culture, but the main one, the real one, the way you really destroy a culture from the inside out is by destroying the family, destroying the family unit. I know not everybody agrees with that because you've been brainwashed by the very Bolsheviks that want you to destroy family. And a part of the cultural shifts that is often evident through the music and such that has destroyed marriage and family is fornication culture, abortion, contraception, cohabitation, all these things we take for granted. And I get it, I grew up in the same culture also. And I'm not saying anybody that does those things are bad, but you gotta understand, they're not best practices. They don't lead to a culture, or, and they're not bred from a culture that honors life, honors the family, truly wants to see the society thrive. And this is not just me making stuff up, this doesn't come from my religion, this comes from anthropological studies. And we could talk a little bit about that in a moment. So some of the problems, let's talk about the state sanctioned problems. You and I don't 
own ourselves. And I'm not sure you guys really understand that. We have this, um, especially in America, we have this imagination that we're somehow free. But it's the farthest thing from the case because the minute you are born, you are given a tax stamp, a tax ID, a social security number. And the minute you come out of the womb and that paperwork is filled out and your name is there all in caps and you're given a number, you now, that name and that number that you're associated with is legally owned by the government and banks. You may or may not know this, but that's your, that's you as a asset, uh, how would you say, um, liability for the government. The government owns money. Our government, I'm talking about the U.S., but I'm, this is like all of Western civilization. This is how we end up in all our world wars and the things that we're doing. And it's part of the reason why life sucks, but I'm not complaining. When you were born, you are held as an entity in, uh, in lieu of, I can't think about the word, but they're, they're, you're, you represent what the government owes to private banks, the Federal Reserve Bank, the Federal Reserve. You may have heard of the Federal Reserve. We don't own our own money. We actually are deeply in debt, and you are the stand-in for that debt. If anybody remembers the word, tell me down below. It's like you're the, you're the collateral, collateral. You're, I think that's the word. You're the collateral for the debt, right? Like if you want to buy something, sometimes they'll put your house on collateral. You are on collateral. Not only are you on, on collateral, but the fruits of your labor are on collateral. That's why you pay taxes. There, you, if you are paying taxes, if you have a social security number, you are collateral. You are a battery in the system. Whether you like it or not, you may not like what the system is doing, but if you work, you earn money, they will come to your house with a gun if you don't pay taxes. And the fruits of your love with your wife are also owned by the government if you put your kids into the tax slave system by having a social security number. I know it sounds crazy because it's like, well, who doesn't have a social security number? Aha, uh -huh, but it wasn't always this way. Now marriage, marriage fits under this umbrella of government control through marriage license. And it's all born out of the same stat tax slave system, whether you like it or not. And the way it works is that if you marry a woman, now you're, you're, and you use a state license, you're asserting several things. One of which is the children that you born, they will be a part of the system too. Your tax, your, when you sign that marriage license, you're essentially saying the fruit of my labor and the fruit of our love will be given to the government. And if your kids have social security numbers like mine do, that name, a number, mind you, it's not the entity, the name and the number, in particular the name in all caps, legally, and the number. If your name, if you write your name in all caps, that's the name that the government owes. Notice when you look at government uh, documents or legal documents with your name on it, it always has, it's always in capitals. Because that's what's owned. If you write it with lowercase, it's a different thing. It's strange that it's this way, but I've learned this through research, right? So federal, the Federal Reserve, tax ID, when you get married, your marriage now receives the benefit of a tax status that is beneficial to you. So you're going to pay fucking taxes anyway. You're going to marry this woman anyway. So they get you by saying, just sign this paper and you'll pay half the taxes. You won't have to pay as many taxes. Just let us own you, right? And that's how we let people own us. That's why, you know, and I'm not separate from this. I'm not saying this like I'm holier than thou. Uh, I'm in the same system. But it's good to be aware because there are things that you can do. You do have a level of autonomy, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Cool. Now, number two, right? So that, that's, that's from the puppet master uh, organizational, governmental rules and laws and obligational standpoint, right? Not much you can do with it about it. You're born into this ma matrix. I'll talk about different ways to finagle in a moment, but you're born into this matrix. It literally is a matrix. But the matrix isn't just a physical matrix, it's a mental matrix too. And so the conception of marriage, people's ideas about marriage, what are the best practices for marriage are totally denigrated. Nobody even knows what a fucking good marriage looks like. That's why I began by saying, you know, I have the blessing of my parents. We've, we've, we've 
married, we, my wife and I basically grew up, she, she, she's my high school girlfriend, watching my parents interact. So we have a model for marriage. If you come from a broken home, you have no model for marriage. And we got about three or four generations of no model for marriage. Because the model for marriage has been effaced. It's been defaced. And it begins in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, but comes to a peak during the sexual revolution. A lot of the things that we take for granted in terms of fornication, right? Like everybody, you're just having sex. It's not a big deal. Just free love, right? Contraception, well, I can blow my load with as many women as I want. Women can just get run through by as many men as she want. Nothing will happen because there's a piece of plastic or, ca or chemical castration that means no babies will come. We're free, but are we? So these are some of the cultural things that we take for granted. What else? That, that, that attack, mind you, on the hearts and minds and sanctity of humanity, the family, and children is a literal attack. And this video is not about going deep into the rabbit hole of who and why marriage has been attacked, but it sounds something like Olsheviks, and it starts with a B. And a lot of the people that perpetuate this unfolding are in our government, they own Hollywood, Dave Chappelle made a stand-up comedy show that was well-received by people who were awake, but not so much by the establishment talking about these people. I'm not going to mention what they happen to be in this video. You, know, you go figure it out on your own. But there is an attack, and a lot of them don't even know that they're attacking. So Antonio Gramsci, uh, Mark Lukacs, the, um, uh, the, the Frankfurt School, Started in Germany, got kicked out for some strange reason in the 1930s, made its way into New York City at uh, uh, um, Columbia University, and amongst many of the things that they unfolded was critical theory. And critical theory is critical of everything traditional. That's how you destroy a culture, you criticize it. And so you criticize the religion, you criticize the family by criticizing the father, you criticize all traditional practices, you criticize anything that held the society together, you, will, you, you encourage people to question it or even fabricate stories about the culture. And you gotta remember, our educators are also the enemy. The government educates us, and the government is owned by these Bolsheviks, right? So you gotta understand that if we are living in a time where marriage is confusing and marriage is not working, it's not because marriage is bad. It's because it's been bastardized. It has been abused. It has been destroyed. Some of the myths of marriage, uh, I go into great detail in a YouTube video that captured a talk that I gave at the first Patriarch Convention, uh, which is an event that happens here in Florida every once in a, once in a while. And I, the, if you look it up, it's called Defending Marriage in a Degenerate Age. Uh, but some of the myths that we've adopted as a culture under attack, ideological subversion, is that we are actually like bonobo monkeys. Ooh, 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 and we just, ooh, 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 and we just hump. And so we, there's nothing noble about being a human being. You're just a fucking intelligent monkey and do with your dick whatever you want. That sort of attitude where marriage and sex is desacramentalized, meaning it's no longer sacred, leads us to the shithole that we find ourselves in right now. So if you're watching this, and the things that I'm saying sound so wild in counterculture, even though it's been the way beyond the last maybe 100 years, you are a byproduct of the brainwashing. And again, this is not to knock you or to make you feel bad about yourself, but to wake you the fuck up, because I see it. I'm a married man, I'm defending marriage in a degenerate age because I know that the attack is not coming from marriage itself, it's coming from the enemies of marriage and the family. Enough said for that. Moving on, so what do we do, how do we behave, and how do we unfold this whole trap, or how do we navigate it in a resourceful way? So what I'd like to talk to you about is the right way to do things. I'm gonna to talk to you about proposed solutions. So, 
there's a book that's a name that I took the name and slightly changed from much of what I'm about to say. It's called Protecting Your Marriage in a Degenerate Age. And the guy does, a, I forget the name of the author, but he does a great job of destroying some of the myths about marriage, one of which is that it's a religious thing and that it's just you know, a, a, a Roman Catholic kind of made up convention and that the barbarians never did that. They were just boning women randomly and busting children out and no one knew who baby belonged to who. That was not the case, never the case. And then also the lie about polygamy. In most cases where polygamy unfolded, that man was responsible for a whole lot of women who would otherwise be in danger without his protection. And I think this has a little bit to do with Mohammed, PBH, and Muslims, and their whole idea about the relationship between men and women having many wives. And it has something to do with the, the context of the time, and a man who has, is well off can protect all these women. Now, she, they, she might owe him sex or something like that, but we don't have that anymore, and that's not a normal thing. But the truth is that we are pair bonding beasts. That is natural to an elevated creature like we are. A noble creature doesn't behave like a dog. Like my dog will fuck anything with a hole in a heartbeat, but so many of you. And a part of the reason why marriage doesn't work is because of that. Once again, that was sex was weaponized with contraception and abortion and divorce and all this other shit. So if you think that you're anti-feminist, but yet you're boning chicks who are chemi chemically castrated, you're a promiscuous man, living your best life being an alpha, guaranteed you're a feminist because the feminist weapons have allowed you to behave in the way that you behave, which is undignified completely. Marriage to one woman and raising children with her is not only the dignified way, but the biological right way. Once again, read the book, do your own research, see what actually works in a culture. When a culture is family oriented and pair bonded, and they stay married forever, the society thrives. That's a, that's a masculine society. That's a patriarchy. Father rule. Shit doesn't go sideways. Although the feminists have lied to us in many instances about what that actually is. Part of the way you get the sexual revolution is by creating oppressed classes. And so a lot of what we got in terms of the destruction of the family today comes from a narrative that was, began unfolding in Seneca Falls in the 1890s that positioned women as oppressed and men as oppressors. It was never that way. Women loved their position as being provided and protected for by men. You see, there's a sort of a trad movement with women happening slightly today. It's not totally trad, but they want the trappings of a traditional marriage. I get to stay home and raise my children. They want that. But yet the damage in many ways is too deep to change their psyche so that solipsism, solipsism, I can't even say the right word, but this you know, nature within women that allows them to imagine that they're always right and put themselves in a position where they'll destroy a family and feel justified, right? Neither here nor there. So what did we do before? Well, one place we could potentially look is the book that Western civilization, Christendom, is built on, the Bible. Whether you like it or not, your, your, your deepest moral and values and virtues are biblical. It's from the Bible. I mean, like it or not. So at least take a look and see what that blueprint hath unfolded. Two places you can look, old and new, of course, old. There is a story of Isaac and Rebecca, which is like kind of the first, one of the first examples of a marriage and how it happened back in those days. And a lot of you guys are going to say, well, boy, fuck, I got a lot of wives right now. The way it was considered was that when a man and a woman join together, have sex, they're married. And so as the story goes, I think uh, Isaac's father was, it wasn't Abraham, Abraham, yeah, Abraham Isaac. Abraham sent his servant out to go find a wife for his son. Check that out too. Parental involvement, 
big piece of the pie I'm going to talk about in a moment. Sends his servant down, go find my son a wife. And the servant did his great job finding the right woman. He had vetted her perfectly to be the woman that would marry King Abraham's son, Isaac. And as the story goes, you know, he, the whole vetting process it unfolds right there in the Gen book of Genesis. Then he, he takes that girl after she consults with her parents, right? Notice, Isaac's parents and her parents were consulted. Big part of the missing piece right now. And then she leaves with the servant and goes and meets her new husband. She goes into the tent. He goes into her. They're married. How many bitches are you boning right now that you would call your wife? Probably not many. <laughs> so, but that's the way it was. And, and, and then it goes a little bit further in Corinthians 6, 16 through 17, where Paul describes how when a man goes into a prostitute, he is joined to that prostitute. So if you're boning these broads, whether for pay or for play, you're married to her because there is a karmic connection. There's a depth of exchange that happens. It's, we're not just bumping ugly beasts. We're divine, noble creatures. So we, that's, that's a new conception. That's, I'd like to impart that upon your way of thinking, right? Marriage itself Traditionally, I know you mentioned tradition. He says, I want to do tradition. It says tradition, but as most people who don't understand tradition, they leave out the church. Everything in Western tradition, everything in Western civilization, for the past 2,000 years, its tradition is found from the church. But I know that's a hard thing to understand. There's a great book called How the Catholic Church Created Western Civilization. I mean, just facts, you know, but, you know. Facts or opinions these days, so if you don't like what I'm saying, who cares? Marriage would happen, first of all, as a community vow. These two people are saying in front of the community, not the state, in front of their community, i.e. church, that we agree to be one thing. And we're asking your blessing to sacramentalize this through the church so that we can go into the marital act with all of the blessings from our society and grace from God. So traditionally, the marriage had a lot, had more to do with the community and God than it had to do even with the church. The church didn't create marriage. The, the church just sacramentalized marriage. It was between those people and the community saying, we're going to do it and we're going to do it right through. The church then comes in and says, let us bless you. Let us bless you. Let us bring God. And this, this is all the work of Christ. When he goes to the wedding of Cana, he, in essence, sacramentalized marriage by turning the water into wine. Different story. But the Christians adopted that as a, as a, as a, as a belief that, oh, God wants marriage and God wants to be a part of marriage and God will elevate your marriage, turn water into wine, if it's sacramentalized so there's a blessing that happens through the church. I would not get into a marriage without the community's support and love. And that's when you get married and you, the, the, the community's support and love is a part of it, it means you will always go, you're willing to go to the wise people of your society, of your tribe, before you take any marriage fucking counseling. What did we do before counseling? We went to elders. We went to our community. We don't have community. We don't have elders anymore. I get it. It's a fucking shame. But we didn't go to therapists. Therapy? Are you fucking kidding me? You're going to go speak to a woman who's never been married herself or has had three divorces? Who has babies out of wedlock? Who's got a high degree at a liberal university to arbiter your failing marriage? <laughs> That's what most people do. But back in the day, because the community was a part of it, you went back to the community and say, hey, guys, you know, we're having a hard time here. And the elders, people who have been married for 50, 60, 70 years, who understand the struggle but made it through, they would counsel you. So the destruction of the family is a destruction of the, of, the, uh, civil, of the community, too. You understand that, right? It's not just when you destroy the family, you destroy that whole social structure. No elders. They're all 
old, broken, and in homes. Old folks' homes. So everything kind of falls apart. So community vow, church, uh, church sacramentalization. The way it started becoming a state thing, just fun fact, is this, the, the church would just keep a record. Oh, yeah, we, we, we record that this happened on this day and these people made this vow. But then, as is today, you know, when things go astray, the government and the church come, in, or come together or the government imposes itself on the church and says, hey, I know you got those records. I want to know every single one of those motherfuckers that got married and I'm going to keep them in my census. Because there's power associated with it, right? So, you know, inst anything that becomes institutionalized is, becomes destroyed because every physical institution is a fallen institution. So the church is a fallen institution also, right? The, the church, the government, all institutions are fallen institutions, meaning they literally fell into the third dimension where there's limitation. So it's, that's why we live in a sinful state, right? Fallen world. And it's, it's not about fixing the fallen world. It's about how do we best navigate this bitch so we don't fuck things up. Solutions, best practices. Man, this is going to be a long video. Best practices. I'm not even going to explain. I'm just going to drop these and I'll let you guys clean up the mess. Number one, no sex before marriage. No sex before marriage. People who have sex before marriage have a higher incidence of getting married later and falling apart because we live in a culture of bone and go. So if it doesn't work out, we leave. But if the prize is at the other end of the commitment, well, you know who actually wins? The man. When sex is inside of marriage and men are the ones who decide to marry, not all this new bullshit where women are getting on their knees, men are the ones that decide to marry, and sex is inside of marriage, men are actually the gatekeepers. When sex is outside of the marriage, women are the gatekeepers, and then marriage becomes in sort of optional thing. But if you want to get the goods as a man and you want to keep it in a resourceful way and actually have a family, don't fuck her before you marry her. If she's already got a past, well, that brings us to the next piece of advice, right? Marry early. Get married early and stay early because the earlier you marry, I know this is counterculture, but just bear with me. This is my opinion. The earlier you marry, the less sex partners both of you are going to have, the less mistakes you're going to have. And even if you tell a, a teenage person who's bubbling with hormones that this is the best practice, they're not going to listen. Because the music they've been listening to in the Disney movies, I've been telling them, oh, you have to fall in love and have sex to have an enjoyable life. But at some point, they're going to realize, oh, wow, the traditional way, oh, wow, what my parents say, it's actually right. And you don't want to wait till you're... 24, 34, 40 fucking four before you are a born again virgin and I'm trying to do it the right way. No sex before marriage and, and then also marrying early, that's the point. We're gonna bring sex, we're gonna, we're gonna have sex, we're gonna do it in marriage and I wanna have sex with you because I'm at my prime. Let's get married. Now you say, oh, but people are so young. They don't know much about themselves. How could that marriage work? Ah, oh, my friend, unfortunately, you don't know tradition. Fortunately, I do. So no, uh, let me go a little bit further before I explain that. No cohabitating. Ask the parents. So no cohabitating goes along with no, no sex before marriage and marrying early. Ask the parents. The reason why parents get involved with the marriage, the reason why you should ask the father, the reason why the father gives the Yes or no to that girl, whether she can marry somebody, is because the parents have their best interest in mind. Now, I'm not saying your parents know everything and that you have to listen to everything that your parents say. You're going to do what you want to do anyway. But there was a time when marriage lasted because the parents were involved. Now, mind you, if your parents are divorced and they come from divorced parents and they don't know shit from fuck about marriage and making it work, then I get it. You, we don't have any elders. We don't have any elders. But if things start unfolding in the right way or you create a community, or you become a part of a community that wants to do things the right way, you ask the parents because the parents are actually worth listening to. I get it. Most parents aren't worth listening to today. The parents are actually worth listening to. You want to consult with wise counsel. And also, your parents have your best interest in mind. 
Like, my daughter, if she shows up here with a guy that I can clearly see is a slap dick and isn't going to fulfill what I know she needs, because oftentimes parents know their children better than children know themselves. And that's, that's not a bad thing. It's that the parents love you so much that they're observing you, and sometimes you can't see yourself. Also to the young man. So if he comes, he's a slap dick, I'm going to have to tell her, I don't think it's, gonna, it's a good fit. I don't think it's a good fit. I don't think it's a good fit. But most dads don't have that type of authority anymore. You got the responsibility if that shit breaks up, but you have no authority unless you fucking take it by saying, ah, ah I'm speaking up. What father has to say is very important. Even if what you say goes in one ear out the other, you still must say it. That brings us to deep vetting. You got to know what this woman's values are if you're going to make it work. And that means religion. And I know people hate it because you might not be thinking about religion right now, but if you marry a woman from another religion, or you marry someone who has religion and you have not, the topic of God is the topic of everything. It's the overarching of all things. Because your worldview is going to be precipitated by your spiritual view. So if you're dealing with somebody and y'all have totally different spiritual values, it's probably not going to work. You got to speak and you got to agree. You got to agree on a lot of things before you decide to marry this person. And most people don't have those conversations. They're not willing to have those conversations. You got to talk. I didn't know guys who married women that didn't know that their wives were liberal until the pandemic. All of a sudden, their wives are walking around masks and telling them they need to take the shot. I'm like, whoa, what? they're like, whoa, what the fuck? Like, I didn't realize how different our values were. I don't understand these homes. This is why I get in trouble sometimes for talking about women shouldn't vote. There should be one vote from a family because the family should have the same values. So that's another best practice. That's a lost practice. Lost best practices, no sex before marriage, marry early, no cohabitating, talk to the parents, vet deeply. Final piece here, modern best practices. What do you do if you want to make this shit work in a day that's so degenerate that it don't? Number one, you're involved with the law regardless. Even if you don't marry and you live together, even if y'all just talk on the fucking phone and FaceTime and you're millions of miles away, there's a way that a woman could finagle and say that you're her, you owe her something. I've seen it happen. There's shit in the news about it, right? So bottom line, if you're boning a bitch, the government thinks that you're married. She can find a way to make it that way. You could be responsible for children that aren't even yours, right? So what do you do? Before you go down too many deep rabbit holes or up into her wormhole, you should craft some legal documents. Because the law is involved either way, except if you take proactive action and then get involved, at least you can choose the fair conditions. Let's choose some fair conditions. And this is not about power. This is about defending against an attack. So you got to create some legal document. If you're going to marry her, right? You're not going to do the whole state sanction thing, which I don't blame you. You still have to do a state sanction thing because you got to have, you're going to have to hire a lawyer. You're going to have to craft a contract. There's no other way about it because doing nothing is doing something. And listen, I like the traditional way. I like traditional Catholic marriage. If I could have it that way, of course, I'd say that that would make my day and it'd be great for everybody except the gays. But you're going to do it today, you got to craft, craft, craft a fair agreement. I don't like it. That's what you got to do. Number two, don't bind to a woman without protection. Same sort of thing. I'm not talking about wearing condoms. I'm talking about you need legal protection. Number three, stay married so you never have to deal with any of this stupid shit. And staying married begins with the stuff I said before about who to choose to get married and who to involve in your marriage and what to think about before you marriage, get married. And I'm not talking about thinking with your lower head, your upper head. Stay married. Stay married. I don't understand these people to get married. And then they get married a second time after a divorce. Marriage is meant to be forever. Think about the first chick you bones. In God's eyes, that's still your wife. I don't know. But you get what I'm saying. Don't take it light. Imagine, 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 imagine the first girl you had sex with is actually your wife. God's like pulling her up from like high school. Like, hey, what, remember her? <laughs> That'd be bad. Stay married. And a part of the way you stay married is by working with the sacraments and the sacrilege of destroying a marriage through the church. 
One of the things that makes the Catholic faith and orthodoxy so attractive to me is its rigor. And a part of the rigor means that there's a definition for certain things and everything isn't arbitrary, right? And at least Catholics are the only ones that really maintain that, this, that marriage is indissoluble. Protestants, all the other religions that you're allowed to marry. Of course, there's finagling ways, and you could just leave the church, so it doesn't matter. But if you truly are a person of faith, and you're not just living faith, listen, living the faith is inner and outer. It's not just an inner thing. That's why people who say all you got to do is believe and you're good. No, that's not it. How do you conduct yourself? And if you're a person of faith that conducts himself spiritually and within the matrix of the world in a spiritual way, then you're going to want to sacramentalize your marriage. You're going to want to get that blessing from your marriage. You're going to want to receive the graces that come through the sacraments of matrimony to help your marriage last. And so that's it. That's all. That's just my opinion, y'all. Do what, it, what you want. Done.